this. But um, I had done a lot of work on my house, and Ivy came to me and said, you know, our house is 1920, but I'd love to know who built it. So once I got into the deed vault at Hackensack, they call it the vault, um, and it's just mountains of old papers now computerized. But the original owner was William and Edith Collins, and he was from a Collins family that were Scotch golf club makers. And in the early 1900s, he came over to the States to teach the gangs how to play golf. And when I found his obituary in the Bergen Record at the Johnson Library in Hackensack, it said he taught Woodrow Wilson, Bernard Baruch, Dwight Morrow, because he was the first pro at the Knickerbocker Country Club in, uh, in Tenafly. So he had some interesting clientele. So it turns out that some of his uh, golf clubs were made in the States. And this one actually says, Willie Collins, uh, Knickerbocker Club, Tenafly. Got it on eBay. Uh, he gave one to the homeowner, and then I found an extra that, that I took. Um, unfortunately, when I went down to the golf museum in Short Hills and did a little more Willie Collins research, he shot the second worst score ever at a U.S. Open. <laughs> <laughs> but I think more to his fame, he was on the Demers Council for one term, and you can understand why. He found out that the insurance on the Firehawk House and the Borough Hall had expired about five years before. And he complained that the police were making too much money. And I think he really just had enough, and he, after one term, he was, he was done. But um, that, was, that was what got me started before that. Oh, I'm sorry, I had a picture. The only image I could find of Willie, also on eBay, was an ad he did for Peter Pura Soap. So I have no idea if this drawing was anything like Willie. They had no children, they had no descendants, so I couldn't track anybody down. But uh, yeah, he, did, he did make, uh, get some national exposure with his future ad, and he made this thought prowess. What got me started was my house. Uh, because when we bought it 20 years ago, it had this little black out front. Just a little three by three black on the front door, the E.A. E. King house built 1891. It's not an official, you know, house uh, landmark plaque or anything. So finally, after my kids were a little older, uh, I was able to get some time to try to figure out who Mr. King was. It was a hack and sack, and he turned out to be a fellow named Urban Abner King. And the good news was, oh, here's a picture of my house. The good news was that Mr. and Mrs. King, Kitty, we're right on the main drag in Hallworth, which you're, you're on for about two minutes and then you're out of Hallworth. Uh, the Kings were from a town called Benzonia, Michigan, which luckily is even smaller than Hallworth. It's a population of about 800. Um, and it was founded by some Congregationalists who went out there and were going to have another Oberlin College. That didn't work out, but they were all lumber people. So I just called up the town clerk in Benzonia, and she didn't know she wasn't supposed to give me any information. So she said, oh, King, and he was married to a vet. And this was, they built the house in 1891. She said, well, King Vet's great niece, Mabel Peck, is still in town. So you really need to talk to Mabel. And then after that, she gave me, she sent me copies of their marriage certificates, um, just their deeds out there, anything having to do with the, the King family. So I got hold of Mabel, and um, may she now rest in peace. I got to Mabel just in time. Um, <laughs> Mabel sent me a picture of the King family. So it's Kitty, Betts King, Urban, and their daughter, Joey. They also had a son, Urban Jr., uh, who served on the USS George Washington in World War I. But it was always a puzzle to me that Urban Jr., not pictured here, obviously, was born in 1900, and Kitty would have been about 50. And I, the math just never really made sense. So Mabel kind of lowered her voice and said, well, you know, the family secret, really, is that Urban Jr. was Joey's child. And so that's why there's no birth certificate for Urban Jr. or much record other than that he served in World War I. Um, but 
But the King family had a, a aside from some of the early Dutch farms in Haworth, uh, it was one of the first houses in town. They helped to start the little congregational church, which was across the street. Mr. King donated the land for it. Uh, this building has now been torn down, and there's a big, rather large brick edifice there now. But the church, just to show you how you can mine little nuggets of information, church records, town records, library records, women of the church records. The church had a cookbook that was published in the early 1900s uh, that's in their library. And so I was just leafing through it one day. And there were several recipes that the Kings contributed. Uh, lemon cake, which sounds kind of normal, and then Mrs. King submitted a pork cake recipe, <laughs> which I actually did make one time for a potluck in town. It was a pound of salt pork, chopped fine, dissolved in one pint boiling coffee, two cups of brown sugar, two cups of molasses, cinnamon, cloves, and grated nutmeg, a pound of raisins, eight cups of flour, and a heaping teaspoonful of soda. Uh, Mr. King died at a young age. <laughs> so, after sampling Mrs. King's pork cake, I cannot understand why. He actually, after 20 years in the house, the same as us, went bankrupt. He, had, he was a carpenter, and so he did the beautiful, we had beautiful hardwood floors, very narrow slats, and his mill was in Closter. Uh, and his, he had his business on 11th Avenue in the city, hardwood, hardwood floors of specialty, it said. Um, so he looked bankrupt, and there were actually documents in Hackensack that showed an inventory that was done, every screw, every saw that was liquidated. Uh, and they moved back to Benzonia because they still had family out there. And um, again, thank you, Mabel Fick. Um, she sent me the obituary of Mr. King. He, they had only, she told me they had just arrived from Haworth. Their furniture hadn't even come yet. And suddenly, all Benzonia was shocked to hear of the sudden death of Urban King, who dropped dead in S.W. McDonald's grocery store at 8.30 a.m. Wednesday. Uh, he was 58 years old. So again, it's just, what you're doing is, you know there was a TV show of Walls Could Talk. Um, I kind of look at a house as a, a living thing that you just take care of for a little while and then it gets handed down to the next generation. So, you know, I just was always interested in who talked in that room or who spilled juice on the kitchen floor or what Christmas tree was, was in the same corner as ours. Um, so there are just so many sources, especially on the internet now. Ancestry.com, the census records, the, the deeds, the military records, knowing that, um, that Irvin Jr. served on the USS George Washington and was relieved of military duty when he got the Spanish flu in uh, 1917. So those are just some of the kinds of things that I will stay up till 3 a.m. researching. Um, while my husband and dog sleep next to me. <laughs> the house, uh, I'll get through with my house in a second, but the second owner was once I got the, the, the string of ownership, our house had about 15 owners, I would say. And we're now tied in first place. The second owner was a fellow named George Hurd, H-U-R-D. And I knew he was Haworth Postmaster. So, you know, there's a searchable New York Times database. You, you've got to play with that. Just put in your street or, you know, a, the, your ancestors' names if they lived in this area. And you'll, you know, amazing stuff will come up. So I put George Hurd's name in the New York Times, it goes back to 1851. And I was astonished to see about a dozen, 15 articles come up. And unfortunately, none of them were good. At this point, my husband said, does anything good ever happen in our house? Um, he was a postmaster, and there was a convention in Atlantic City. And he had a little 16-year-old female helper from the next street over, Martha Conrad. And he took Martha with him to the convention, posing as his daughter. And she, they came back. Her family first tried to blackmail her to, to say, can you just give us money and we promise nothing will come of this. That didn't work. So he was arrested, uh, charged with various crimes. The women of Haworth 
I love the headlines. I mean, this was in the Huntsville, Alabama newspaper. Women demand sentence for postmaster. Um, so he was convicted. All the women of Fort Worth came out to, to cheer on Miss Conrad's family. And then, unfortunately, Heard is fugitive. His bail forfeited. He ran off. And I think he went to Arkansas, but he was never seen again in these parts. So his wife lost the house. Um, but then going to the women of the church records, the Congregational Church, the church talked about preparing Thanksgiving dinner for the family after he took off. Talked about giving them some gold coins for Christmas. So it was kind of nice to see that, you know, that people came to her rescue. Um, so there was a semi-happy ending to the story. Um, the, the third homeowner was a fellow named Joseph Cordelview out of Brooklyn. And he made news, he was also in the papers, 38 years of automobile driving without an accident, without ever receiving a ticket, and even so much as a bawling out. <laughs> the state gave him a big award for safe driving. Um, and in one of the interviews I saw with him, he said all he ever did was once touch the end of the garage with his car, which is our garage, um, which is still standing. But other records show that he was, um, that he bought a Packard in 1910. This was through the Brooklyn Eagle, which you can also search through the Brooklyn Public Library. It had a list of some of the first cars bought in the New York area. And my guy was really into cars. And he worked on an automotive magazine, so he bought a, a Packard. 1910 was very early to be buying a car. Um, so that's kind of my house. I did find one, around Thanksgiving a few years ago, there was a knock on the door, and it was a young fella, Spiridakis, who grew up in the house. And he had some pictures. During his time, it was painted brown with yellow trim. Um, which is not a color scheme that we maintained. Wow. Um, it's still, Hallworth Avenue is, is very uh, witty, wood, wood, woodsy. Um, we didn't do well in Sandy, for, you know, just with the trees coming down. So it is, it, and it's a boulevard at, at the point where we are. Um, and you can walk to school and walk to town. When my son was little, he said, Mom, there's so much to do at Hallworth. He's now 23, he no longer says that. <laughs> um, we're population 33 numbers, I guess. Since today is the 150th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's death, I have one house that has a very convoluted uh, history with Lincoln's assassination, not directly, but this uh, was built as a boarding house in Ocean Grove. It's now the Aurora. Uh, when it was built, it was the, the Thorn House, and Miss Thorn built it. Oh, it's really late. It's really late. Yes. Where's my best So did you save it? Tony said now, although it was just for sale for $3,750,000, <laughs> and they reduced it to two and a half million. So I don't know if it sold or not. But the fellow that owned it wanted to know if anyone interesting had ever stayed there. It did have 30 bedrooms and six baths, so it, it, it was not a top-of-the-line boarding house. It was kind of a mid-range. A lot of coal miners from Pennsylvania, that kind of thing. So the Ocean Grove newspapers do give you a rundown of who stayed at all the various hotels and boarding houses. This was the you know, late, hey, late 1800s. So I dutifully went through the names, and a lot of them I just put in Google to see if anything interesting came up. And a couple of names came up. One was uh, Reverend J.H.A. J. Bomberger, who was the founder of Ursinus College. Um, he, he stayed there. And then the more interesting fella, and this is the, the LinkedIn connection, was this man named Thomas Pendle, P-E-N-D-E-L, who wrote a book called My 36 Years in the White House. He served under a lot of presidents, but the first president he served was Abraham Lincoln. 
And the night of the assassination, he stayed back at the White House. He was one of President Lincoln's um, bodyguards slash doorkeepers. Um, so the night of the assassination, he stayed back at the White House with Todd. And as word came in that the president had been shot, as he tells in his book, he was the fella who stayed with Todd and comforted him through the night until Lincoln died the, the following morning. Um, so the time he would have stayed in the Aurora was long after the, uh, the assassination. But it did, at one point, it was owned by a family called the Bull family, Frank Bull. And Frank had a daughter named Marjorie who was swept off her feet by a visitor, one of the, the, uh, the customers um, was the Jones family out of Pennsylvania. The father was a coal miner. They had a son named Alan. I don't know if the name Alan Jones rings a bell, but Alan became a Hollywood actor, singer, donkey serenade was his, his famous. So he married Marjorie and they went off to California. He started getting a little famous. Um, and it wasn't long before there was a divorce notice in the paper, July 26. The next day, there was a marriage notice of Alan Jones marrying one of his co-stars. So I guess Marjorie came back to Ocean Grove and stayed in one of these bedrooms. But uh, Irene Her 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 Herbie was the name of the, uh, the actress he married after he got Marjorie. Um, this is... A, a house in Rye, New York. I've done a couple of histories in Rye. Um, on Forest, uh, I don't know if it's Lane or Avenue, but it, it's just a beautiful shingle style, shingle and stone. Um, and she knew nothing about its history. Um, but it turned out it was built by some of the early folks who started Rye Playland. Before it was Rye Playland, it was a couple of very trashy parts which burned to the ground, and I think the people of Rye were glad they burned. But that was the fellow who built it. Um, but the more interesting owner was an actor. It's fun when you get an actor, because then, when you could spend thousands on eBay, buy, sign, play bills from. But unfortunately, he's faded into the mist, but his name was William Courtley. He changed his last name to be Courtley, uh, C-O-U-R-T-L-E-I-G-H because he thought it sounded better than it was previously. Um, he did a lot of Broadway, uh, some early movies. He was married to a woman named Edna who was a Gibson girl. A very striking woman. Um, I also went to the uh, Library of Performing Arts at Lincoln Center to look him out because, you know, like I said, once you have an actor, you, you can kind of go crazy. So this was Edna. Um, and I found his great-grandson because he kept the courtly name. And the great-grandson uh, had some old pictures of the house. So you can kind of see that it really has not changed significantly at all. Uh, the friend of mine who lives there just redid the kitchen. <laughs> but uh, other than that, it's just a very grand, grand old house. Um, now, Mr. Courtley, of course, he, the Times had plenty of material on Mr. Courtley, every production he was ever in. Um, and, and they had his obituary. Um, Citing that he was the juvenile lead of an actress named Fanny Davenport. He was in Augustin Daly's famous company. But the first sentence, William Courtley, an actor who played important parts on the American stage for 40 years, a member of the board of directors of the Players, a shepherd of the Lambs, died of acute indigestion yesterday afternoon at his home, 394 Saturday <laughs> Rye. She, my friend, I think, never looked at the dining room quite the same way since. <laughs> Um, but it left Edna in quite the straits because here her source of income was gone. She had three sons, all of whom had served in World War II, and some, a couple of them turned into minor actors. But then 
in later years, newspapers thought she opened a small uh, diner in the town and, and carried on that way. Um, this is a house in Montclair on one of the mountain avenues. I get all those mountain avenues confused. But the good thing about this house was that it was built um, by architects, uh, go, check the names for sure, Goldman and Van Fleck, Joseph Van Fleck, there were a lot of Van Flecks in Montclair. Um, but Goldman went on to start the architecture department at the University of Texas, and luckily he took all his archives with him. So when I contacted the University of Texas, they immediately sent old pictures and architectural drawings, which never happens that someone actually kept the blueprints. Um, but because this fellow is up so no. And you can see this house also really hasn't changed over the years. You know, why, why mess with a perfect brick colonial house? There's some gorgeous houses there on the mountain. I'm just going to uh, quickly hit a, a couple of things just to give you a brief headline. I was giving away my services at a school auction, and the woman who won was a friend of mine, but she lived in a 1950s split level on Schraubenberg over there. And I thought, well, this is not going to be fun. You know, 1950s split, you know, I just couldn't imagine we turn up anything very interesting. But the house was built by a Rockefeller. And if you get into those Rockefellers, they all do come from the same immigrants who landed up the Hudson. So that was kind of fun. His name was Earl Rockefeller. He was a, a New York City cop. And his son is, is still around. He said this house um, had water issues, flooding issues. So they finally sold it, moved to Crest Hill, and built an identical house that would not flood. But the son told me that when the house was built, some of the children took some fossils and shells they had and threw them into the concrete of the back patio as it was being constructed. So my friend went out and sure enough found the, found the shells and the fossils. That would have driven me a little crazy to figure out why they were there, so then, then we found out. Um, and this house, you might know, it's a white house on um, the corner of Old Smith Road in Clinton in Tenafly. They used to put big wreaths up in the windows every Christmas. Um, it was built by Carl B.C. Smith, who claimed to have graduated from the University of Michigan, but they had no record of it. Um, but he was a big realtor in the area and developer, and the side road is actually called Old Smith, Old Smith Road for Carl. And when I did the history, um, one of his daughters was still alive in Cresco, and um, I talked to her, and she just, she, you know, when you talk to the actual family members, they bring out the local color. She just talk, talked about how her dad made homemade wine in the basement, and Clinton is, has a huge hill at that point, and she talks about how, she talked about how they would go sledding and down the hill in the old days. So it always helps to, to get to the source. Um, this is an old farmhouse in Closter uh, that the Doremus family built. Uh, the father, this was Cornelius, Cornelius's house. His father was known for, um, he was a carpenter and made one the first coffin for Major Andre um, after his uh, demise. Um, and the fun thing about this is that we did track down family members who had old pictures. So we were able, yeah, people posing and, um, you know, once you can get into a treasure trove of someone who actually kept this stuff, I always go to, you know, estate or yard sales and see all those family pictures. And you always think, you know, how did that, that happen? There must have been someone somewhere who would have cared. Um, Another brick house, also in Rye. Um, the most interesting owner of this house was a fellow named Webster Stover, 
who had been a college president at, um, at Arnold College in New Haven. Um, but he was, he, he definitely had a temperament to him. In 1956, he decided his property taxes, which were a thousand dollars, were too high. <laughs> so he refused to pay. And he started, and, and for years he refused to pay. So every year he would take a clothesline, run it from a window to a tree, and start adding clothes to it um, to irritate the neighbors and the town. <laughs> this is, it, that made the paper, Angry Citizens Tax Protest Angers Neighbors. And you can see some of the, some of the clothes hanging. Um, so this went on for a while, and it ended up in the Supreme Court. Cut to the chase. You know, he spent a couple of days in jail at first, and then, then it got to the Supreme Court. Um, and finally, it was decided against him, you would expect. Uh, he ended up spending a total of, let's see, 11 days at the beginning, and then he had to spend 19 more days. So he spent about 30 days in jail. I really don't know whether he ever paid his back taxes or not. I talked to Webster Stover's daughter, and when I brought this up, she knew nothing about it, <laughs> even though she would have been in her 20s at the time or so. Uh, so I think she blocked it from her. <laughs> but it's still known in the neighborhood as, you know, the memory of this house still, still lives on. Um, this is a house I did in Bernardsville. In Somerset County, <coughs> this is the, the biggest, fanciest one I ever did. It again, recently so. It was built for a Princeton lawyer named Henry Young, who married Alice Ballantyne of the Beer Company. In fact, their Newark home is currently part of the Newark Museum. Um, this was their country home. Um, so there was a lot of documentation. The architect was a fellow named Gifford, who also did the Mount Washington Hotel. Um, he did some buildings at the Columbian Exposition. Oh yeah, it was recently for sale for 10.75 million Brushwood, it was called. But they were really, you know, most homeowners have one or two little things that they're really curious about. And the thing that they were curious about was some stained glass windows. Uh, this is one of them, which were in the library. There were, I think, eight of them. Um, but the only, the clue was there's a, a some wording underneath Washington with a few different S's and Kitson. So I started doing a little Washington Kitson window investigation, and it turned out that they were exact copies of the windows at Sulbright Manor, which was George Washington's ancestral home back in England. Henry Young had a real thing for George Washington. And as I was reading about him, he had a full statue of Washington in his foyer. Uh, he was on the committee to honor Washington for some you know, centennial thing or other. Um, and it, it was interesting to me that if you look at Mount Vernon, <laughs> yeah. and look at the house, I think that was the ultimate uh, Washington ripoff that he was trying to take. Yeah, but at least we, we did solve the puzzle of the windows. Uh, one of my favorite houses is this one in Rockley. Everyone knows Rockley, the little historic community up in MW. Um, and the, the woman who lived here, this house was built in 1835. Um, but she knew who built it, but Joseph Du Bois. And the Du Bois Family Association will tell you that in America it rhymes with voice, not Du Bois. So I'll call it Du Bois. So Joseph Du Bois um, and his wife built it in 1835. He had, a, he had a sloop. There's a lot of Rockley history available. They had a sloop that he used to take farmer's goods into the city. Um, he was mainly a farmer. But the, the people that live here now in Rockley, actually, this is their second home. They live in Demarest, and they wanted a little country house. 
Probably is about five minutes from there. <laughs> but it's a totally different feel, you know, obviously. But it's beautiful. This house is beautiful. But she wanted to know um, where, she wanted some pictures of the divorce family. And she wanted to know where they were buried. Because that's happened before. People want to visit the grave to feel kind of a kinship or a continuity or something. Um, so the Palisades Historical Society down the road, you know, New York and New Jersey are really mushy over there, and the lines blurred over the years. Um, so Palisades, New York is, you know, a minute from there. But they, the woman there said he was buried in, it's a cemetery uh, that's just down the road. You have to go through someone's private gate. Just close the gate behind you and it won't be a problem. But the cemetery, there was Joseph, and there was his wife, Elizabeth Conklin. Conklin's a big name over there. But, uh, so she was one of the Conklins. So there, there they were. Um, and then the picture of Joseph, they also had. Did not have a picture of Elizabeth, but they did have a picture of Joseph. And the divorces, um, like if you're an Alpine or the divorce road, they're all, they're all connected. They're all kind of river. Um, the one thing that was uh, interesting about this house was I asked the homeowner early on, you know, some people don't want to know the sad stuff. Yeah. You have to decide if you're, like I did a house in Glen Rock and it turned out the, the owner during the depression had rented out the house and he and his family kind of fixed up a little chicken coop out back. 